Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hope Newport. I'm the Family Services Manager here at the IFOPA. And um, this is our third and final um, resource in our third quarter of the advocacy series. It's a new program that we started here at the IFOPA. And this quarter in the advocacy series, we've been focusing on tools and tips to help you advocate in the medical setting. So today we are gonna focus in more specifically on advocating during a medical emergency. Um, and we've got some really great resources to share with all of you. So before we dive in and get started on that, I just wanted to go over a few sort of um, Zoom items to make sure everyone's able to navigate today's webinar and we can address any issues or questions that come up. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit questions if you have them for Julie or Steve. Um, to prevent any background noise, you're all muted, but you can submit questions through the Q&A and the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So you may need to just scroll over that. You can click on Q&A and submit those directly to us. And um, if you have any sort of technical question, maybe you're having trouble with translation or um, you're not any, any sort of technical Zoom question, please feel free to put those into the chat um, and I'll be monitoring that and we can answer that there. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to let remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded. So if you're someone who likes to um, take notes and capture all of the information, Julie's been kind enough to share her slides. So you'll be able to go back and um, review her slides. And then there'll also be a recording of the presentation today. So um, with that, I'm excited to introduce our two panelists. Our first panelist today is going to be Julie Hilton. She's the Vice President of Marketing and Communications, the Marketing and Communications team at the Medical Alert Foundation. And um, Julie works, um, to, she oversees all digital print and social media marketing and communications and partners closely with their member care team to ensure a consistently excellent customer experience across all touch points. So Julie be with us today helping to provide an understanding of how Medical Alert works, a little bit about the organization, how it was founded, how it works, and um, what sort of services they provide. Julie will be followed by um, Steve Eichner. So you may all know Steve from one of the, his many roles in the community, including administrator for the largest online support group, the FOP Community Support for FOP. Um, Steve is also a member of the IFOPA Family Services Committee, where he serves as a sounding board to help guide our programs and resource development. And in his day job, Steve is the Health Information Technology Lead for the Texas Department of State Health Services. So Steve, um, you know, his professional background and also his longtime experience as a medical alert user um, are great attributions. And I know he's excited to share how his experience creating his profile has been, um, has evolved over the years and the role that that plays in him feeling prepared for um, medical emergency situations. So um, as you, Julie will be sharing with us here in just a minute, Medical Alert isn't um, by any means a new company and it's certainly not new to the IFOPA community. Um, it's been in existence for a while and I know it's something that community members have been using for a while, but their platform is constantly evolving. And um, I know that there are always new families in the community who can benefit from these types of resources. So we're excited to continue to carry on education around um, Medical Alert and how it can be a helpful resource for our community. And after um, Julie and Steve have spoken, I'm gonna share just a few uh, emergency medical resources that were created um, by the IFOPA or in collaboration with leaders in the FOP community that you can all access as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen and Julie, I am gonna hand it over to you to tell us a little bit more about Medical Alert. Sure, let me pull up the slides. And thank you, Hope, for, uh, for having me today. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, Medical Alert Foundation, as you mentioned, has been around for a while. This is our 65th anniversary in 2021. And uh, you know, as you'll see, uh, based on our history, we've been essentially serving the same mission um, ever since we were founded in 1956, which is saving and protecting lives by sharing information in our members of moments of need. So a little background on Medical Alert, as I mentioned, um, it's been around since 1956. And um, Medical Alert and the, the, our founder, Dr. Marion Collins, are actually the original creator of the medical ID. 
Um, it all started when his daughter, Linda Collins, uh, had uh, he, the, his, Dr. Collins and his wife were out of town. Linda was playing with some friends. She was around 14 and um, cut herself pretty badly. She needed stitches. So they, uh, the people she was with took her to the emergency room and she was given a tetanus antitoxin um, as a normal course of procedure. Um, but what they didn't know was that she's allergic to it. Um, so she went into anaphylactic reaction um, and a coma, uh, was in the hospital for like 10 days, almost died. And, you know, her father was so frustrated because he's like, I knew that she was allergic to that and I wasn't there to protect her. So how am I going to be able to protect her? Because I know I can't be there for her every minute of every day. And they started at first, like, creating a little paper bracelet that had her allergies on it or pinning a note to her shirt when they sent her to school. But a few years later, when she was going away to college, they were like, we need something a little more uh, permanent. And uh, so Dr. Collins went to a jeweler in San Francisco and he worked with them to create kind of what you see, very close to what you see here, the original Medic Alert bracelet. Um, that had uh, Linda's number, Linda's uh, name and uh, her conditions on it, as well as a phone number for uh, Dr. Collins. And um, when she went away to school, very quickly, other people in her uh, that she came in contact with were like, wow, you know what, I am uh, I have type one diabetes. Like I kind of need to let people know that I have a condition or I have asthma or I have some other type of food allergy or I uh, have a seizure disorder epilepsy. So. Dr. Collins and his wife very quickly realized that, you know, while this was a noble thing they were doing to try to protect their daughter, that there were a lot of other people that could benefit from some sort of medical identification that let people know about their specific conditions in an emergency. And he and his wife founded the foundation, um, originally running it out of their living room in Turlock, California, uh, which is where the headquarters is still today. And, uh, you know, fast forward 65 years and uh, a lot of the tenets of what we provide remains the same. Um, we provide medical IDs. Um, we also operate a 24 seven emergency response service so that um, in addition to what's engraved on your medical ID, um, first responders have access to other information about your condition. And since the beginning, we've been a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're still a nonprofit today. And um, we have saved to date over 4 million lives and counting. So, you know, when Dr. Dr. Uh, Collins said two really important things when he set this up, first was, um, I think I'll save more lives with Medic Alert than I ever will with my scalpel, which turned out to be true. And, you know, we're really not here to make money. We're here to save lives. And that's still the Medic Alert ethos today. Um, so what is Medic Alert? It's a globally recognized symbol of protection. Um, it is recognized around the world by first responders, doctors, nurses, health professionals, clinicians, EMTs. Um, we have headquartered in the United States. We have another affiliates in other countries around the world. Um, but we also support members around the world. So if you're outside of a country where we have a um, we have an affiliate, we can certainly provide coverage. Um, we would create a different ID that has a different uh, call number on it for anyone who is outside the U.S. And our member services team has translation services for 140 plus languages. So we're able to um, really provide support anywhere around the world. So how does it work? Well, there's a couple pieces that all work together. Um, the first thing is uh, your health record. So everyone that um, joins Medic Alert has, in addition to their ID, a digital health record. And that records a lot of different information. And we're gonna get into the specifics of that in a second here. But, um, but that is really kind of the, your digital snapshot of your health conditions that's provided by you. you um, create, update, and maintain that health record. Um, you're, that's paired with your ID. First responders around the world are trained to look for a medical ID. They'll typically look first at your wrist and your neck, then they'll check other places, but they'll always look there first. Um, your medical alert ID should have your most important um, 
medical condition engraved on it. Um, whatever first responders need to know right away in an emergency, everything else is stored in your digital health record. Um, first responders then can reach out to our 24 seven emergency response team. Um, they're able to do several things. One is to relay all of the health information from your profile to first responders. Um, another is to reach out either to your emergency contacts, um, because nobody should have to be alone in an emergency, and uh, also uh, physician contacts, if that's uh, part of the membership that you have. And then, you know, what that really means is uh, that in an emergency, you hopefully, well, as we've seen over the years, have better outcomes because first responders have the information that they need to provide fast and accurate care. Um, you know, they're not going to, uh, they're not gonna do a diagnostic trying to figure out uh, something about a specific condition. So um, fewer tests, less cost, but um, better care in the, in, the, in the end time, in the end run. So we talked a little bit about the Medic Alert Digital Health Profile. Um, it really is the key to getting the most out of your Medic Alert membership. Um, it is, like I said earlier, maintained by you. And um, people ask me a lot, like, you know, what about HIPAA? How, um, you know, how, how, do, how are you able to share my information? And the reason is that the data that we hold is provided by you. It is user generated. Um, it is not taken from, say, Epic or another electronic health record from um, from a uh, from a hospital, for example. And because you have provided it, and you explicitly give us the um, permission to share it in an emergency situation, that's how we're able to provide information when it's needed in that moment of need. Um, so there's a lot of things that you include in your health profile. Um, allergies are really important. Um, any uh, medications that you're taking, uh, medical conditions, uh, list of vaccinations, if you have specific instructions, which is, I think, very relevant to, um, to this audience. And um, like we talked about, sort of emergency contacts. And then um, we've also developed in um, cooperation with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, a very specific asthma action plan. Um, so for people that have asthma, what are their rescue medications? What are the dosages? When does it need to be given, et cetera? Because often somebody that's having an asthma attack can't communicate that information uh, to people that may need it. And um, the health profile as it is laid out is something that we developed in concert with the American College of Emergency Physicians. We said, what are the most important things that people need to know? And it was, a, number one, if you're allergic to something. Two, if you're on some sort of medication that's going to affect how you're treated in an emergency. Like a really great example is blood thinners. If people are on blood thinners, you know, how they are treated is, is very important and very different. And uh, also insulin, other things like that. And then again, medical conditions, vaccinations, patient instructions, et cetera. So like I said, you create your profile. It's very easy to update online. If that's something you don't wanna do, our member services team will help you do it. Um, that's what they're there for. They'll happily spend uh, 45 minutes with you on the phone going through and uh, including uh, each medical condition and each medication, dosages, et cetera. So there's a very rich amount of information there that we're able to share with the first responder in an emergency. And then um, what we often do is if uh, someone is being transported to a facility, then we will transmit those records directly to the emergency room or the hospital or the urgent care facility that they're being taken to. So that by the time they arrive, um, the care team there already has all their information and they don't have to reiterate all that information again to someone else. So um, we talked about Medical Alert membership plans. There are several different um, tiers of membership and um, they offer different things based on different needs. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sort of each of the things that is included in the different plans. Um, there's some things, and I apologize, my, 
my check marks got messed up here. Oh, well, I will fix that. Um, the, uh, there's a few things that are common across all um, Medic Alert memberships. The 24 seven response team is available to everyone that has a Medic Alert membership, that digital health profile that we talked about. Um, something we've added this year is the ability to um, keep a full vaccination record. Um, you know, a lot of people said, I want to be able to store my COVID vaccine information. And then we're like, you know what, you really need to be able to have maybe your tetanus and uh, if they're for kids, especially lifetime vaccination information there so that it's very easy to access. And then a printable health record. So that digital health record that we talked about, you have the ability at any time to either download it um, as a PDF file or to print it and take it with you, which is super handy if you're going to see a new provider or you're, a lot of people will print it and take it with them if they're traveling and have it tucked in uh, their suitcase or their purse just in, just in case anything happens. Um, so with the Advantage plan we, and the Advantage Plus plan, we also add emergency contact notification. So you know, if you want someone to be contacted in, in the event of emergency, um, we will do outreach to the people that you designate. Um, we also provide a service, and this is something we've created in um, partnership with the Alzheimer's Association around wandering support. There are certain populations um, uh, very specifically people with Alzheimer's or dementia, also uh, children with autism that are um, at a very high risk of wandering from a safe place. And uh, Medic Alert has really specialized over the years in providing support for someone that has wandered. Uh, we create a missing persons uh, flyer. We reach out to the local, um, local authorities, hospitals, um, ambulance services, et cetera, and um, have a very good track record in helping people who have wandered become reunited quickly. And again, that was something that we started doing um, in partnership with Alzheimer's Association. Uh, we've also added recently the ability to add a hospital or facility preference. Um, I think for a lot of people, this is something that's very important, um, especially uh, probably for this audience as well. You have certain doctors and facilities that know you. And, uh, and understand your needs. So that's something we've added recently. And then with the Advantage plan, um, there's also ability to add document storage, which is uh, really could be a lot of different things. I know a lot of people, if they have say some sort of implanted medical device, uh, that they will provide the device documentation or instructions on how to how to handle that device in a, in a medical emergency. Sometimes it's just very specific instructions of if something happens to me, here are things that need to be taken care of. So we're able to store um, those documents. And then the last is around advanced directives. This is really important to a lot of people, um, understanding your care directives and your end of life wishes so that um, in an emergency, if you do not want to be resuscitated, that um, that we're able to communicate that and share the documentation with first responders. Um, and I will make a note here, um, you know, if you have DNR engraved on your ID, for example, um, most emergency response people are not obligated to, um, to, to honor the DNR on your ID, because with a DNR, you need to have a very specific form that's signed off for your doctor and the appropriate documentation to back it up. What we do is store that documentation so that in an emergency, we can transmit that actual, you know, um, authenticated document to the care team, to the EMTs, to the emergency room, so that they understand that your, your wishes, so. Um, those are some of the things, so there's more, but I wanted to call out some of the ones that are most important. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Julie. I want to yeah. plug real quick. We just um, last month did a webinar on um, end of life conversations. So just touching on the advanced directives that Julie mentioned, if you're looking for more support and resources on that aspect of care, 
um, please do feel free to reach out to me or I will also um, share the link to that in the follow up email from this. But I agree, Julie, that's a really important part to have factored into your medical information. Great. Thank you. All right. So one of the great things about Medical Alert is that we offer a lot of different types of medical IDs. I think what people are most familiar with is the classic medical ID that you see up there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but, you know, different strokes for different folks. A lot of people are comfortable with one type of ID versus another. So we provide a lot of different options. There are dog tags, there are stretch bracelets, there are more, you know, sports friendly silicone IDs. Uh, we have sterling silver and 14 karat gold IDs for people that um, that are interested in, you know, a piece of fine jewelry that actually works for them. And then at the bottom, you see some examples of the accessories. One thing that we added late last year was um, a ID that slides onto the band of your Apple Watch. And um, that has been really well received by a lot of people. And then you'll see on the bottom right, two different types of shoe tags. And um, these are for people, especially for people that are not comfortable wearing, say something on their wrist, um, having a shoe tag is another way to keep an ID with you all the time. And this is Steve, I'm gonna interject really quickly yeah. because the, the IDs and the tags are really great, but you could have more than one. You're not constrained to one particular Things. So one of the things I've done, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, is I've, many of my pairs of shoes that have shoelaces have a shoe tag on them. I have a bracelet or and there's something on my backpack. They all, the way that they're linked to your record is that there's an ID number that's associated and personal to you with your medical alert ID number and then the phone numbers to contact medical alert. So you don't have to worry about synchronizing all that up and you order the product directly from Medical Alert and if you do it after you've logged in, it's got your ID number and you can, depending on the particular device you're using mm -hmm. or the particular tool, there's different amounts of engraving that can occur on the different sized items. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done is I've, I've tended to pick items that allow for more customization of information than necessarily the prettiest thing right. on the planet. Because that because what one of the things I was concerned about was communicating to hey, avoid intramuscular injection mm -hmm. as a, a early warning or, or hey, limited mobility, limited flexibility. Right. And if you only have one line of text that you can customize, that becomes a little bit hard. Right. So yeah. Um, I think that's a great point, two great points actually, Steve, about um, there are a lot of people that have multiple, um, some people just because they're like, I want one that matches every outfit, which, you know, okay. Um, but there are other people that like, I want to make sure I always have something with me. So actually having, having them already on the different pairs of shoes that you typically wear is a great idea for keeping them close at all times. And yes, um, every ID has a specific a uh, number of characters and lines that can be engraved. Um, some have more space than others. And if you, uh, if you talk to somebody in our member services team, they can point you in the direction of which ones have the most engraving space. I will mention here that the, the one up here in the upper left-hand corner, the classic has five lines of engraving. The large classic has six. The, um, the dog tag also, it has, I wanna say at least six, if not seven lines of engraving. So. Um, so some of these have quite a bit of space to be able to customize your um, information. And talking about engraving, um, you know, the whole point of the ID is so that the first responder can know right away what your situation is and what your needs are. So you really want to put the most important thing for them to know on your ID. Your health profile will have all the additional details. And as Steve just said, um, there is the 800 number across the top. That's the number that goes to our 24 seven emergency response team. Um, and then at the bottom where you'll see a uh, medical alert ID number, that's where your uh, unique member ID. And as Steve just pointed out, that's really the key to your record. That's the thing that links everything and that lets, uh, 
lets our team be able to share the information that you have on file. So um, this is something that uh, we had talked about as a potential engraving. This is just suggested. I'm sure Steve has some other thoughts on this, but if you do have specific instructions around procedures, um, for instance, Steve just mentioned like no intramuscular injections, um, that's something that you may wanna have on here as well. Now, Steve, you have any more thoughts on this? Um, not really at the, at the moment. We'll come back to it a little bit as I talk a little bit about it. Okay, great. I think what's interesting is that, you know, especially for people with rare conditions like FOP, um, sometimes if you could put FOP, but that doesn't really tell the first responder anything because they're very likely not to know much about it. So again, you want to describe it in terms that are going to be useful to the person that's providing treatment to you if they didn't know anything about your condition. So just a point there. So one thing I wanted to bring up that we um, introduced about, I don't know, three or four months ago, um, we've talked a lot about that digital health profile and all the information that is stored in there. Um, this is another way to make that information just that much more accessible and that much more useful to you. Um, what we've done is create a, a wallet card that has a QR code. That QR code is linked to your health profile. And when that is scanned, they're able to uh, see, as you can see on the bottom, again, those categories that we talked about, allergies, medications, medical conditions, et cetera. Um, this is part of uh, available with any medical art membership. And it's a very easy way to sort of keep your health record with you at all times. We've had a lot of people that are caregivers purchase these. Um, so when they are you know, going to a doctor's appointment with someone or going to a pharmacy and they need to know like what are all the different medications that person is taking, um, the QR code is an easy way for them to access that. And uh, so, it's uh, something that is carried either in your wallet or um, I've seen people, I've, I actually saw someone who like punched a hole in the corner and attached it to a backpack. So, um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can use that. And that QR code is something that by the beginning of next year, we'll actually start offering um, on IDs as well. So some people don't, some people just prefer not to have something printed on their ID and they'd rather have a way to, um, I guess not, not disguise, but to, um, to be more discreet about their, um, their information. It's also um, provides a lot more information than you can get in the five or six lines of engraving that you have on the ID, because as you can see below, it accesses the full health record. So, um, so be, by the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, we'll be offering QR codes directly on the IDs themselves. So where does that leave us? Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what medical alert is, is affordable protection for everyone. Um, you want safety and protection for those people living with chronic medical conditions. So we talked about faster, more accurate treatment means less cost, or that's actually the next point, improved health outcomes, and then avoiding unnecessary medical costs, reducing the burden of excess excessive testing during an emergency, which just makes everyone's life easier, uh, especially in a stressful situation. And, um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole point of medical art is that, you know, we, we hope you never need it, but we want to be there when you do. And uh, just like insurance in a way, you know, we never know when an emergency might happen, but you want to be prepared when it does and make sure that you have set yourself up for the, the best possible outcomes in that situation. Um, I did want to talk a little bit too about our partnership, which we kicked off earlier this year with NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Um, we're very proud to partner with them. NORD is actually offering uh, medical alert assistance through their patient assistance program, which is called Rare Care. And for patients that meet their, um, their threshold for financial need, they're providing uh, medical alert IDs and memberships for a three-year term. Um, and I have embedded the link in here 
uh, to the medical alert rare care program. So encourage you to, to take advantage of that if, um, if you're interested and have the need. And then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we would love to be able to help help you, help protect you, help you be prepared for an emergency situation. Um, you can contact us, our member services team at the number here. Um, we're at medicalert.org. And um, for anybody that is interested in getting a medical alert ID, um, we've created a code for you that'll give you 25% off the ID, not the 14 karat gold ones. Um, but, uh, but pretty much, or, or the, the sterling silver, but pretty much all the other IDs, and that's good through uh, the end of this year. So we invite you to, to try out Medical Alert and, um, and let us help you and let us help uh, protect you and your family in case of an emergency. So that is really my whole yeah, thank you, Julie. That was so informative and there's some great resources in there. I did want to mention the Nord Rare Care Program is for um, U.S. citizens or um, patients only. So if you are someone who's outside of the U.S. who's interested in this and you um, need financial support, the IFOPA does also have a program um, called the Harold and Elaine Kaplan Quality of Life Awards. And while that program does not pay for reoccurring um, fees, such as the annual membership fee for Medical Alert, um, it would be a way for you to apply to have the cost of the ID um, covered. So if that's something that you're interested in and you live outside of the US and you um, don't qualify for the Nord Rare Care Program, please um, do, I'll send a link for the Quality of Life Awards page so you can read more about that and apply for that program and use the discount Julie's provided if, um, if that works. So thank you, Julie. That um, gives a really helpful foundation to lay before we turn it over to Steve. So Steve has joined us today. And I know you're going to be telling us a little bit about from really a first person perspective, a member of the FOP community, what having a medical alert bracelet or um, ID means to you. And then also just about a little bit about your journey to personalize it and make it as effective as possible. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks so much. And before I start talking about that, also on the financial kind of picture, really quickly, most flexible spending accounts, like through your, your employer, can be used to pay both for a bracelet and for those annual fees. And That's you may right. also want to check with your insurer to find out if they also might cover the membership or the bracelets. That may vary more significantly than the FSA, the Federal Savings Account, kind of stuff, and again, that, that's U.S. focused, but that's another opportunity to not have to spend as much money out of your own pocket. If you, if you can use an FSA, that basically saves the federal taxes if you go that route, and it's pretty easy to do it. So if you're in a position to take advantage of that, it's something that you might want to consider. That's a great point. Thank you, Steve. So that, now, now on to the personal experience in you know, kind of what it takes to actually set up the profile and using it and, and kind of where it can be really helpful. As I mentioned earlier, I've got the shoe tags on most of my pairs of shoes that have laces and basically all that's there is the medical alert uh, phone number, the, this insignia and my ID number. And what that means basically, as long as I've got a pair of shoes on, if something were to happen to me, the emergency responder can easily see my shoe and say, hey, I know what that insignia looks like. Okay, it means I, need, I know I need to react to it. I also do have a bracelet that I wear 95% of the time and a tag on my backpack. One of the things I've done, you know, I've had it for probably 15 or, or 20 years at this point and maybe even longer. One of the things that I did I did early on was I picked an ID that had a lot of lines for engraving because I like to talk a lot. And from an FOP perspective, there's a lot of information that one really might want to convey to an emergency responder if one became incapacitated about, you know, limiting intermuscular injections. In my case, my jaw is pretty immobilized. So that's kind of important to know limited jaw movement so that if someone needed to try to, try to intubate me or something and they've got a problem with my jaw, they've got an idea 
as to why. And in the early days, I actually used a line to say see a wallet card predating the offer of the, the Medic Alert wallet cards using the IFBA's wallet card with all the contact information in there again. So the first responder could say, okay, yeah, hey, in, in case they didn't look at my wallet, they could actually get an instruction right there that says, hey, there's more information to be had and where to go in addition to the resources available through the calling the medic alert or, or using the quick cart code or using the web portal to pull the information that way. Mm -hmm. As Julie said, it's really easy to configure a profile. Uh, way back when there was an IFOPA profile that we established and we're gonna work with her and, and get some of the data back restored back that included things like standardized text for limited jaw movement and some of the other kind of common terms. Uh, again, way back when there were not a lot of drop down fields or self selects you really had to do a lot of free text entry. The good part about that was you had a lot of freedom. The bad part about it was you had a lot of freedom and using terminology and codes that made sense, not just to me, but to the first responders or other people who were seeing the data became kind of complicated and make, making sure that it was easily understood. So that's an advantage of using the drop down pre select kind of text. And it's a huge vocabulary, but we'll also work with Julie, I think, to make a couple little tweaks and get a couple of terms inserted so that it, it's more easily understood. Like limited jaw movement needs to get reinserted back in and, and tweaking that actually, probably in some of the things about vaccinations to like avoid intramuscular injections is something we need to get added back into the allergy piece because it's not really an allergy to a chemical, but it is effectively an allergy and putting it in that context makes a great deal of sense. Oh, hey, yeah, check the allergies. Well, okay, hey, avoid IM injections is certainly allergy related. Steve and Julie, well, I don't know if both of you have answers to this. Is Steve, was there like a cadence to the length of time that you would go between updating your record or was it just whenever some like a new flare up happened and you had a new need you would update it? Or Julie, do you have got advise um, clients to update well, that a standard? Sure, the, 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 rec the medical record is not a complete medical record in the sense that you're trying to put in every office visit and every subsequent flare up or things like that. The medical record is really an overview of primary risks, primary kind of responses. You can add notes about the other pieces, but that may or may not be clinically relevant for an emergency response. You know, it'll support however much time you have to put into it. I try to go in about every quarter and update data to make sure things are current, phone numbers for physicians haven't changed or things like that. Sometimes I've let things slip a little bit longer than I should have. I, I've tried to get better about that and put a calendar, unlike my Yahoo calendar, my work calendar, that are reminding me to go in and take a look at it. Good once idea. In a while. Yeah, I and think I, quarterly is, is very good. It's a very good cadence um, because things change, people's phone numbers change, you, your emergency contacts may change, medications may change. So that totally makes sense to me. Yeah, so, so that, that's kind of my personal approach on it. You know, from a user perspective, I, I didn't come straight on, but let me come straight on on it. You know, I've got a phone in my pocket most of the time. It's password protected. There actually is a medic alert save screen that I got put up so that it, it's got the medical alert phone number and my ID number on, on my screensaver, if you will, on my phone, so that if I'm unconscious and you turn on my phone, there's emergency contact information right there that can links back across. But if I'm conscious, hey, I can unlock my phone or tell a provider what's going on. But if I'm not conscious and Nancy or someone who knows me isn't around, How's the emergency responder going to know much about me? Or if I were a child, you know, a, a seven or eight year old child with FOP certainly knows they have FOP, but how can they convey information to a provider, teacher, nurse, whatever, 
in an emergent situation for a parent's not easily around, around or accessible about some critical information. And things like medical work become a really good tool for that at the same time without broadcasting it to the world. I mean, anybody can look at my wrist and see the medical alert bracelet on it and get, okay, that means there's probably some kind of medical information about him, but they're just by glancing at it, there's no real indicator as to what it is. So that, that kind of gives you me a little bit of an animate, an 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 I can't say the word. <laughs> it, lets little, say, it, it, lets, <laughs> it lets me be a little bit more anonymous in public mm -hmm. rather than kind of a, a very broadcast as, hey, here's what I've got broadcast to the world. But again, the, the idea and the insignia is well recognized as, hey, we need to pay attention. There's, there's more information to be had, and here's an easy way to get it. And uh, I've fortunately never had to use it in the sense of pulling it for a medical record. I'm, I'm grateful about that, but it does give a great sense of comfort to know that, okay, yes, here it is, ready to go in case there's a need. And as Julie mentioned, we can, you know, it can support document attachments. So one of the things I didn't do, but I need to go back and do is update it with the current treatment guidelines for FOP. And that's something that we can put in and make available. So it's kind of preloaded so that everybody doesn't have to load that up as a, as a separate document. And again, because that document is written really for medical professionals for use, it's really, really, really helpful to physicians as they're looking at providing care to have that resource available. And, you know, looking at the ability to, to have that and have the medical teams, the emergency responders, both, you know, ambulatory and in the ER, have contact information for the FOP docs is absolutely critical in having good care and coordination because you, you can't sum up FOP in three or four words or even a sentence. Right. You know, outside of emer emergency care, when I have been hospitalized in the last few years, we've reached out to Mona, Dr. Kaplan and others, and they are more than happy to work with your care team in addressing hospital-based concerns and semi-emergent, emergent, situations or kind of on the ground, on the fly, problem solving, and being able to have that information in that ID and first and medical alert reach out would be a really useful tool. So in that sense, looking at advocating for at least a plan that includes the reach out to medical professionals is probably worth it rather than the information being there, but not necessarily being automatically reflected out to me that that becomes for, from an FOP perspective, really worth including. If I didn't have FOP, I might still have a medical alert card so that the information was available, but you know, a, a run of the mill hernia and a run of the mill person doesn't require a whole lot of specialized attention or specialized care. FOP, avoiding surgery being Ties of what's going on, whole different animal. So, so really making sure things are linked appropriately becomes really, really viable and, and, re and really important. I just Again, have I, to pause I, for a minute. Oh, sorry, Steve, to make sure um, if anyone has questions, we did want to try to leave a little time at the end for those. So, if you have yeah, questions, I would, feel free to submit those in the QA or the chat. Um, that's a, that, that's an that's an excellent transition point because I've got I've got nothing more to say but ha happy to answer questions anyone may have and you know do want to remind folks that it, questions are not limited just to the webinar time period if there are any follow up questions at any point please feel free to reach out to either Hope or support for FOP or together at ifopa.org and you know ongoing conversation. Yeah. And I will gladly also connect you to Steve if you're interested in hearing more about his perspective. Um, I wanted to share a few additional pieces of information. So the IFOPA in the past um, couple of years has worked with members of the FOP community 
to create um, a couple of different documents. So as Julie shared, um, and as Steve emphasized, you can store a great deal of information through the medical alert patient um, profile. And um, this is really just to acknowledge that folks have different preferences and some people, um, while you can, it is an option with one of the membership or two of the membership um, forms to print your medical alert profile. Um, we also have one that is very specific to FOP. Um, this one here on the right, the personalized medical form was created by um, FOP community member and leader Amanda Cowley in conjunction with the International um, Clinical Council on FOP. So a great deal of time and effort went into creating this and making sure that here you can see some of the must health read precautions, which is really um, just the key, the critical information for patients with FOP, some additional information here on the left about care. And then on the back, there's um, lots of different ways to personalize your movement. So you can share, you know, if you have restricted movement, where is that in your body? Um, different things like immunizations, um, other medical information. But this is one that has been translated into these five languages, English, German, Polish, Spanish, and Swedish. So you can download this um, editable form from our website. And we also have these wallet size cards that Steve had mentioned he had long ago. We have um, worked with different leaders from around the world to update these and to create um, ones that are specific to different countries. So if you live in Brazil, for example, it will have the FOP medical expert for um, you know Brazil that you could reach out to. Um, and the cards are also translated into the languages as you see listed here. So we have these um, kind of business card, business size wallet cards available for people. Also, you can um, request this, we'll send them to you in the mail as a physical resource, as opposed to the downloadable forms there on the right. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that you can access these and a lot of other forms. If you're someone who is very much a hard copy, you wanna do the binder route and have that in addition to medical alert, um, these and many other forms are available on the website at the link listed below. And oh, then one, que oh. one question on the card. The, obviously, if we print our own wallet cards, they come out on whatever paper we've stuck in our printer. Are the cards mailed from the IFOPA basically just a printout or are they plasticized? Yeah, good point, Steve. They are um, laminated. So yes, they have okay. plastic backing to make sure that um, that's a little more sturdy, a little more hardy for the wallet or all the travel that it will get over the years. So you can and, get these out at home, but we were happy to mail them to you as well. And, and, just, and just as a quick add on, if you don't want to email or mail for one for the IFOPA, uh, most copy centers like a, a Kinko's or similar company can laminate the page for you <laughs> and they may charge a buck or a buck 50 to do that in the U.S. So that, that's an alternative. Yeah. So lots, if you lots, order, of way, lots of ways to get there. If you wanted to have like 20 of them made and share them with, um, you know, your immediate family, extended family to have on hand, that is an option as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, <laughs> Lastly, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the third of our three resources in our third quarter, lots of threes there. Sorry if that's confusing of the advocacy series. So I just wanna reference, if you missed our previous resources, please take a look back. We did a podcast interview with Dr. Ed Shao um, earlier this year about creating um, and supporting your ideal healthcare team. So really about what that collaboration can look like to make sure that on the local level, and then also in your relationship with your, you know, national FOP medical expert that you may consult with, um, that you're doing everything to support them and to have as effective as a team in place as possible. And then last month, we heard from three members of the FOP community, moms, Lara and Saskia, and um, a young woman with FOP, Carly, who shared um, the different tools that they've used to be effective advocates in the medical setting. So um, if you are interested in learning more about really becoming an active player in this um, medical setting field, please do look back or listen to those previous resources. And I'll be sending out an email um, with the link to today's recording. And in that email, you'll also find uh, access or a link to a survey where you can share your feedback on today's event and then also request one of our hard, cap hard copy workbooks. So the Advocacy Series prints um, resource workbook chapters. So if you would like to receive um, one of the first 
two chapters that we've already created or this chapter for this third quarter, we're happy to print um, sort of some worksheets that summarize these three resources and mail that to you so you can continue to work on these skills at home um, or on implementing these resources at home. So um, that is all for me. And I wanna thank Julie so much for being willing to learn about the FOP community. We've had several conversations and she's always been so interested and passionate about um, working with us to personalize it as much as possible. And of course, Steve for um, the many ways that he supports us, but of course for joining us today to share his experience and be um, sort of a patient focused voice for this conversation. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you back here next time.